Rutger Bregman is a historian and author, best known for his best-selling book, Utopia for Realists, and how we can get there. Arguing for new utopian ideas such as a 15-hour work week and a universal basic income, Utopia for Realists has been translated into over 30 different languages, making headlines and sparking movements across the world. Despite the fact we've never had it any better, says Bregman, here in the land of plenty, we lack the desire and vision to improve society. The crisis of our times, of our generation, and I'm quoting Bregman here, is not that we have it good, or even that we might be worse off later, but that we can't come up with anything better. Notching up purchasing power another percentage point, or shaving off carbon emissions. Perhaps a new gadget. That's about the extent of our vision. At best, Bregman provides us with a desirable and achievable vision of human progress. A world with no borders, 15-hour work weeks, and a universal basic income for everybody. At worst, Bregman wakes us up from our dogmatic slumber, encouraging us to ask important questions about 21st century life. Why have we been working harder since the 1980s, despite being richer than ever? Why are millions of people still living in poverty when we are more than rich enough to put an end to it once and for all? And why is more than 60% of your income dependent upon the country where you just so happen to be born? As always, a huge thank you to Cullen St. Gabriel's and all of our patrons for supporting the show. In particular, a huge thank you goes to our patrons, Lily Hooper, Jim Clare and David Lejuenzi. Great name, by the way, David. Lily, Jim and David, your support means the absolute world to us. On behalf of the PanPsychast team and all of our listeners, thank you. If you're enjoying the show and you're as awesome as Lily, Jim and David, head over to our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash PanPsychast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. If you're not enjoying the show, despite being interested in philosophical ideas, pick up a copy of Rutger Bregman's brilliant bestseller, Utopia for Realists. A link is in the iTunes description as well. We're also giving away five copies of Bregman's book. So to be in with a chance of winning, head over to one of our social media pages. In part one, we're going to be discussing utopia for realists and in part two we'll be engaging in some further analyses and discussion thank you we hope you enjoy the show Hello and welcome to episode 56 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the realist, Mr. Jack Symes, and I'm joined once again by the man with a bullshit job, Dr. Gregory Miller. <laughs> Hello. And Mr. Basic Income himself, Rutger Bregman. Hi there. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, Rutger. Mm. Thank you for joining us. Right. Should we kick off with introductory questions as ever? Rutger, the first question we usually ask our guests is, uh, what is philosophy? But your work focuses on a range of subjects, really. So philosophy, mm -hmm. history, psychology, economics, politics. Um, so what term would you say best captures your field? And how, I guess, do you see your role in it? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that history is the most subversive of all the sciences. It, it just makes you question the status quo. Uh, I mean, one other way to do that is just to travel around and, and mm -hmm. visit different countries and then to just experience that, you know, cultures from around the globe are so different and that there's nothing inevitable at the way we've structured our society and our and economy right now. But then history is so much richer and cheaper, in fact, uh, than traveling. Um, there, there's there's one novelist, I believe, who once said that the past is a different country. Um, so uh, take the, the whole subject of taxation that has gained a lot of traction in the past couple of months, you know, with the proposal for a 70% top marginal tax rate mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, the congresswoman in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she, she argues for a much higher tax rate. And then the historian me just can just say, yeah, I mean, we used to have that in the past around the globe. We had top marginal tax rates of 70, 80, 90 percent. And for many people, that's unimaginable right now, right now, because it, you know, would destroy the economy. But then the historian can always point out, we've tried so many different things in the past and some crazy ideas worked pretty well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's a re it's really a quite 
political science um, just by showing people that things can be different. Right. So history is subversive because, uh, in in a way, you travel to a you travel to a new land, but the new land is in the past, and you come back and go, here are these ideas, and you've all taken um, something like the opposite of them for granted. Exactly. And here you exactly. go, and here we let's undermine it with things that we know worked in the past anyway, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, or didn't work. I mean, yeah. um, the question that I always lo- love to ask is how will people from the future look back on us, mm-hmm. right? So we can we can look back on the Middle Ages or the Romans and the ancient Greeks, and we can think, oh, these were such horrible people. They were barbarians. They had gladiators. They had torture. They had all these things, slavery, you know, all these mm-hmm. things that we consider abhorrent right now. And then the interesting question is obviously, how will people three centuries from now, or maybe even just one century from now, look back on us? Right. So what are the horrible crimes we're committing right now? Or what are the things that that make them seem com- completely bizarre um, to to the people from the future? And also, what are the things that, you know, will be completely normal in the future, but now sound completely crazy? So, again, uh, if you look at these things from um, from the perspective of a historian, you start to realize that so thing, so many things are not inevitable that you don't have to take them for granted, and that you can you you can change them. So, how was it you first got into uh, studying history, Rutger? Oh, you know, I was a very lazy student, <laughs> so I just wanted to do something easy, um, and uh, I, I guess I thought, you know, what, well, I'll just be a history teacher or something like that. Yeah. Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was really uh, <laughs> a, a matter of laziness. I thought history would be easy, so that's why I did it. <laughs> you, you kind of always border on, you know, we're saying we, we take these ideas from history, but there seems to be a prescription in what you're suggesting in the book we're going to discuss today. Did you ever do any strict philosophy at university? Well, I did quite a few... Uh philosophy classes hmm. uh I, th- I think i did about half a half a bachelor in philosophy something like that mm-hmm. but i don't have any diploma or anything to prove it <laughs> but i've always been really interested in philosophy and and uh, uh, read a lot about it yeah because in the book itself there's quite a lot of uh, quotes from uh, russell people like this lots of the yeah Bertrand russell's my hero oh, he's good. Uh, <laughs> i was um i think around 19 years old when i discovered him there was a professor in my. This was in my first year studying mm. studying history. But then I did a. I was doing a philosophy class, and this professor was telling me, or telling all of us, that everyone should have an intellectual hero. Mm. Right. So I thought I need an intellectual hero. I don't have that that yet. So the next day, I started googling for just philosophers from the 19th and the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Right. So I looked at John Stuart Mill yeah. and Wittgenstein, you know, the crazy one, and 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 then and then I found Bertrand Russell. And here's this here's this guy who wrote 3,000 words a day, had mm. four marriages, survived a plane crash, started a school, uh, was a brilliant meta, meta mathematician, um, ended up in jail twice because he was. Uh, you know, uh, uh, civilly, uh, how do you say that in English? <laughs> he was breaking the law, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, an amazing life. And then also one of the greatest philosophers, won the Nobel mm. Prize. So uh, that's that's why, why I decided uh, back then, okay, he's going to be my intellectual hero. And um, the first book I read by him was this book uh, called Why I'm Not a Christian. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, now you should know my father is a is a Protestant minister, <laughs> so uh, I was a bit of a Christian back then, and I thought, okay, hmm, well let let's read this. Um, and uh, I think uh, like two weeks later, I was an atheist. Um, oh wow! And uh, this the, the, what really I always remembered is is this phrase that Russell used in one of his works, which is he calls it the will to doubt. Mm-hmm. Right, his he did an interview with the BBC, I think, in 1958, where he was asked mm-hmm. what his advice for future generations would be. Ah, good, I've seen this, yeah. And 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 he said, never believe something because you want it to be true, mm-hmm. or because you believe that there are good social facts because of, because you believe it. Yeah. And um, that that really, you know, <laughs> it was a. Uh, a punch in the face for me back then, <laughs> yeah, good. because I really wanted to believe this thing about life, life uh, after death, and uh, 
I, you know, I basically wanted to believe what my parents had, th- had taught me. Hmm. But then I realized that I couldn't. So, uh, yeah, he was, he's been very influential in my life. This idea that if it's true, it's true. If it, if it isn't, it isn't, says Russell. I think you've got this. Um, it, one of our later questions we're going to ask, I'm going to drop in here, is we have a lot of philosophers on the show who, who change their minds on big questions. Mm-hmm. Outside of going from theism to atheism, have there been any other big shifts in your thinking? Uh, yeah, your absolutely. Thinking? I mean, nowadays, I don't really believe in that, in the will to doubt anymore. <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> I mean, the whole idea of, of the will to doubt was actually a response from R- Russell to another philosopher, the American philosopher, William James. Mm-hmm. And he had wrote an essay on, on the will to believe. And, and nowadays, I'm much more interested in that, actually. So there are certain things that you, that you can believe, and then they be, become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, we see this a lot in relationships. Hmm. Um, if I would doubt the love of my wife for me every day, I don't think our marriage would be very good. Right, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> in that sense, you got to believe, you got to trust. Yeah. Um, and in politics, there are also many examples of this. There are so many ideas that at first seem unreasonable, unrealistic, uh, very expensive, it's never going to happen. But then some crazy people in the margins of society start believing in them and they mm. start building a movement. And somehow uh, the belief itself becomes a reality. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that the, the, the you know the the armchair philosophers as 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 Russell sometimes sometimes was, mm. could be uh, don't get this that sometimes you need to be unreasonable to create change um so these days i'm i'm much more interested in the effects of believing something whether that's true yes or no mm-hmm. uh than just you know it's a very boring question basically is this true or false right much more interesting question is what would happen if we would believe that this is true? Uh, you said there that that's one of the more interesting questions that you're working on these days. And um, we usually ask, you know, our guests in this introductory section, Rutger, you know, what is the thing they're working on at the minute and what is the thing they would like to start working on in the future? Mm-hmm. And I guess, um, is it true? I hear there's a rumor that you are working on a book in human nature. And does this connect, you know, to this idea of um, people being optimistic? Is that the thing you're working on in the future? Or is there... Yeah, it's very much connected. So oh, okay. my next book is about a very ancient worldview that goes back to, again, to the ancient Greeks, um, which says that most people are naturally selfish mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that civilization is only a thin layer. As soon as something happens, a war, a natural disaster, you name it, we go back to our true selves, right? right. We become beasts once again, these immoral mm. animals. Nasty Brutus and short. Yeah. And I, what I argue is that this is an extraordinarily influential idea in Western philosophy, in Western history, in Western politics, and that so many of our institutions are still uh, based on it, mm. and also that it's a wrong idea. But there's a bit of Russell in there, and there's also a bit of William James in there. So the first part of the book is really the Bertrand Russell approach. I, mm. I use the latest evidence from, from, from biology and from anthropology and psychology and economics um, to argue that we need to move to a fundamentally different conception of human nature. Mm. But then the second part of the book is what would happen if we actually believe this? So, right. I mean, I admit that the, the evidence is not conclusive. I, I mean, there's a lot of strong evidence to, to support a much more optimistic view of human nature. But, I mean, we all know that these debates are extraordinarily complex and there's so many points of view. And, you know, every, every new year there's another interesting paper. So, um, after I, you know, did the best I could to make the, the, the case, um, I, I asked the question, okay, even if, if, if we don't really know whether it's true, yes or no, what, what would happen if we really believe this? Mm. What could we do in our democracies, in our mm. systems of, of, of welfare? Uh, what we do on the work floor? How, what would our organization look, uh, look like? Our prisons, our schools, you name it, if we assume that most people are pretty nice. Um, and I've actually come to believe that this is one of the most radical ideas out there, that you can, can completely reconstruct your society i call it uh, i call it neo realism so it's a new <laughs> de- definition of realism uh, usually when we say uh, i'm a realist we we mean oh, i'm a bit of a pessimist right i'm a, mm. i'm a bit of a cynic uh, but i try to redefine that and and to show that actually um, to be a, re- a realist is to have hope to be a bit more optimistic to mm-hmm. trust most people um, so that's what the book is going to be about 
it's good. So you're optimistic about this this new world which we could have, where you know, we're not presuming that Hobbes and people like them and the, and the Greeks are right. I never really liked the word optimism because, for me, optimism suggests a sort a sort of complacency hmm. uh, that you can just sit back and relax and everything will be all right. Hmm. I've always preferred the word hope. Hope is about possibilities. Hope is about getting up and doing something, um, playing a part in, 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 in making a better world. Uh, but hope is not a guarantee. Um, so I, so, some people use the word possibilism. Mm. Maybe, that's, maybe that's a better word. But then again, I mean, it is true that I'm much more optimistic about human nature than most uh. people are. So a uh, simple example is, is what happens after natural disasters. I mean, we always see these news reports about people looting and plundering and all those kind of horrible things. If you actually look at the science instead of the rumors in the news mm-hmm. reports just, just after the fact, uh, then you'll find out that actually what you see every single time is an explosion of altruism. Mm. Even, also, if you go in history, uh, my, one of my favorite examples is the Titanic. So right. mm-hmm. uh, I guess you've seen the film where everyone's in, in panic apart from the string quartet. Um, mm-hmm. If you look at the eyewitness reports, uh, there, was, there was an extraordinary level of cooperation and calm. Mm-hmm. Um, same was true for, well, again, basically every disaster. I've, I've read some wonderful reports uh, about what happened after 9-11, is that people were running down the stairs, and they were literally saying, no, you go first, no, you go first, no, you wow. go first. And they were standing there while, the, while you know, there was smoke and fire everywhere. So that is, that is human nature. That is who we are. Part 1. Utopia for Realists So in 2019, fortunately, life isn't solitary, poor, nasty, brutus and short. In fact, we're now, as you say, Rutger, in the the land of plenty, where almost everyone is rich, safe and healthy. Could you unpack for us why you think this is the case, from a historian's perspective, just how good have we got it? Mm -hmm. Um, If you look at the past 10,000 years, uh, I think you can argue that for 98% of that history, we were, you know, extremely poor, sick, hungry quite often. And according to historians' best estimates, around 84% of the world population was living in extreme poverty. And since then, I mean, there's a, there's a lot that you can say about the numbers and how reliable they are. But the data that we have suggest that we've seen an extraordinary decline in extreme poverty. Uh, and also over the lo- just the last 30 years, if you look at the improvements in global health, they're truly, truly astonishing. Um, life expectancy is going up and up and up, and not just in, in rich countries, but around the globe, uh, in fact. Um, so uh, I, think it's, I think it's important to, to remember that. People watch a lot of the news, and the news is, uh, is often about things that go wrong. You know, things that happen today instead of things that happen every day uh, about corruption, about crime, about terrorism, about violence. But if you watch a lot of the news, you, you, you basically know exactly how the world is not working. Um, so what I always suggest is, is get rid of your newspaper and just uh, read a history book or something like that. And you'll have a much more accurate view of, of, of history and of what the world is looking right now right now your book or Stephen Pinker's book because you both kind of do a similar thing I assume you you've seen Pinker's enlightenment now who he yes came on definitely the show. yeah I guess the big difference between Stephen Pinker and me is that he sort of suggests that all this progress comes from wonderful ideas philosophers in the 16th and 17th century right who were just dare to be rational who mm-hmm. dare to understand and then well, progress more or less happened automatically. Yeah. What I'm much more interested in is the people that we don't know, the people that mm. we didn't remember, you know, the slaves, the women, the, you know, the activists who were first mm-hmm. dismissed often by these white <laughs> philosophers, mm-hmm. these rich, rich guys who were also oh so rational, uh, but who fought for the changes, who fought very hard for them and often paid a very high price for them. Um, and then made this progress possible. Um, 
So I think the irony is about Steven Pinker is that what he doesn't understand is that progress depends on irra- Ill- irrational people, mm-hmm. uh, because the whole thing, the definition of ra- rationality, is is all about power structures, and therefore I think it's very ironical and a bit sad as well that at the end of the book he d- dismisses all the activists of today. Hmm. And he doesn't realize that actually these activists in the past made all the progress possible uh, that he's so happy about. Does this link into why you differ in your worries? So that's that you both agree that great progress has been made for, for I guess, for two different reasons. Hmm. His worry is the climate change, nuclear war, religious fundamentalism or Trumpism. That's the risk. That's the challenge to our progress. Your worry is something different, isn't it? So we're living in the land of plenty. So, so what's the problem for you? Well, I wrote this book in 2014 so it feels like ages ago already (laughs) um and i wrote it in one of the richest countries on earth right Mm -hmm. i i i was uh i grew up in the netherlands just after or just before i should say the fall of the berlin wall in this era that of which intellectuals said that we had arrived at the end of history Mm -hmm. right the famous book by francis fukuyama um and that all that was left was just you know solving small problems Mm -hmm. politics would become technocracy we would just have to get a bit more purchasing power uh, worry about the environment a little bit and worry about what the next iphone is going to look like but that's it um and it was just after the financial crash that i realized a couple of things in the first place I saw only economists on TV, and I was wondering, where are the historians? <laughs> they should get out of the archives and explain what's going on. Uh, the second thing I, I realized is that we only, at that point, knew what we were against, right? We didn't want this. We were against austerity, against the establishment, right. against mm-hmm. the financial sector, against growth, against a lot of things, against everything, basically. Mm. Uh, but we didn't really have an idea of, of where to go next, of, of what a radically better society what that would look like and then um if you look at let's say the past 80 years often crises are opportunities as well i mean this is the story of neoliberalism right it started in the 50s with these economists and philosophers who came together in a place called uh, Mont Pelerin in in, in Switzerland Mm -hmm. and they started building these institutions they they said uh, okay right now where we are uh, the outcasts we don't believe in socialism we don't believe in big government big government we want to privatize everything we we think that the free market is awesome Um, nowadays people think we're crazy but we just got to start preparing for a different time because in the future there will be a crisis and then we can take over what i realized in 2014 is that that system had obviously been successful you know they did take over um in the in the 70s but now it had crashed in 2008 but there was no alternative because there had been no new mont Pelerin, at least not that i could see maybe some small things on the margins but not like a broad-based movement. And I just wanted to be be part of, of, a, of a new Mont Pelerin. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I already saw that there were a lot of interesting ideas out there, universal basic income being one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, hardly discussed, not in, not in the news, and hardly any conferences or whatever about them. Um, and I just wanted to be a part of that. And that's why I read the book. Okay, so we didn't have... 2008 happens and we, you know, there aren't people... Um, huddled away in the corners of darkened rooms before that, waiting to, you know, offer this brilliant socialist alternative. And when it comes, there is no alternative. So instead, what we do is we go here in the out in the open, let's publish our ideas. Let's go, here's a um, full-length argument for universal basic income. Here's a full-length argument for a 15-hour work week and open borders. And this is kind of the role you see it as being then, because we need to have this discussion in public. Mm -hmm. Is that the idea? Well, the task of the intellectual is to be right too early, right? If a lot of people agree with you, then, uh, well, maybe you're doing something wrong. So this is my worry with the universal basic income. It's getting way too popular for me. So (laughs) I should go on and move on to something new. Um, I mean, that's that's the process that we've seen so many times in history, that ideas start, start on the fringes. Um, I mean, whether you talk about the abolition of slavery mm. or the rise of democracy or equal rights for men and women, um, we so often forget that we didn't we didn't love the first people who came up with this. Mm. No, we hated them. 
We thought they were horrible. We we thought we wanted to jail them. Uh, take someone like Martin Luther King, right? So he's now been everyone's everyone's like, oh, there's Martin Luther King Day. Everyone loves Martin Luther mm. King. Well, study history. People hated him, <laughs> right? They thought he was a criminal, a terrorist. Lock him up. Uh, that was sort of the attitude among many, many, many Americans. Uh, and now they're all like, oh, Martin Luther King, great American hero. People people are so forgetful about this. Uh, real progress comes from people who are not who you don't like. So, um, yeah, got to make sure that people don't like you. Got to make sure that things are uncomfortable for them, because then then that's when 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 you get uh, make progress mm. in the name of um, ensuring that people do like you, however. Um, so. Apologies. Could you explain to our listeners what the idea of universal basic income is? And, you know, although you don't, now, as you just said, you don't want it to be too much more popular. In fact, let's make it a little <laughs> bit more popular. Could you explain to sure, our listeners sure. what it is? Let's try anyway. I mean, it's a very simple idea. Uh, what you would do is to give everyone uh, a monthly grant that is enough to pay for your basic needs. So food, shelter, uh, clothing. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not communism. So it's not the case that everyone would receive the same amount of money. No, it's really a floor in the income distribution. You know, something that you can always rely on. Um, what I always like to do is to call it venture capital for the people. Um, it gives everyone the ability to move to a different job, start a new company, um, you know, leave a horrible wife or husband if you don't like him or her anymore. You know, it's really about freedom. Um, that's the most important thing about basic income. The other thing is, and this might be interesting for you, you know, philosophically, is that maybe basic income isn't the right word hmm. because income assumes that you have to work for it, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Um, a, a, probably a much better word would be something like dividend or let's say citizen's dividend. Mm -hmm. um, the philosophy here is that um, there are so many things that we basically should own together, like the air, the water, the earth, the land, and uh, the technologies that were given to us from uh, by our forefathers. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many things that are basically a gift from the past. Just like 0.00001% maybe of our wealth is actually uh, is derived from our own work. And most of it is just a gift. Now, we should acknowledge this and say that a gift is something that you share, right? And uh, mm -hmm. what you then would do is to give everyone a dividend from uh, from that huge wealth that we got from the past. Uh, this argument was already made at the end of the 18th century by the, the founding father, Thomas Paine. Uh, already then, he acknowledged that so much wealth came just from the land, and there were landowners who had just appropriated that, and now we're getting all these rents, and he considered this to be really unfair. So he wanted to give everyone a dividend um, uh, out of uh, funded by all these rents. Uh, there's now a system in place in Alaska. It's it's the it's the only real basic income in the whole world, and they pay this with uh, oil revenues. Hmm. So this already started in the 1970s. Started actually with the Republican government governor Jay Hammond, who said that all the oil in the ground is is the property of everyone. Hmm. So they started a, a big fund, and up until this day, they're giving everyone who has lived for at least a year in Alaska a dividend of around two thousand oh, wow. uh, dollars. So that's for a family of four. It's eight thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Actually, it makes a big difference. Uh, especially if you are living around the poverty line. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's the the way to sell basic income. I should have done that better in my book. I came to realize this after writing it, is that it's it's way better to call it a dividend because then it's also much more an idea that moves beyond the old and boring um, division between the left and the right. Uh, it's really about having a, a state or democracy in which everyone has a stake and in which everyone has a share like like literally a share and and gets a gets a return on investment that's the idea so what are some of the benefits of having this dividend is it just to get people above the poverty line so they can so they can survive or to eradicate poverty in the, uh, indeed in the short run it's the easiest most efficient i think also most civilized way to completely eradicate poverty um in my book i uh 
I, tr I tried to make the simple point over and over again that money is not a lack of character, but just a lack of cash. Hmm. And, uh, well, what do you do if people don't have cash? Uh, you give them cash. Problem solved. Um, many people would say uh, that this just doesn't work. They, mm -hmm. they say, oh, we tried this. They tried this in Venezuela or in the Soviet Union or whatever. Uh, this will never work. Um, if you actually look at the science, and there have been a huge amount of experiments since the 70s uh, around the globe um, where researchers, governments, NGOs have tried to just give people money, no strings attached. And it turns out that almost always it works really well. So the first objection, obviously, that people have is that people stop working. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not true. It's just not true. There was just a big experiment in Finland with basic income. There was no difference in, in the employment rate right. uh, uh, if you compare it to the control group. And the other objection that people have is this is too expensive. We can't afford it. And here's where I always point out is that basic income is an investment with a big return. So what we've seen in many of the ex these experiments is that healthcare costs go down, crime goes down, kids do much better in school. There's one fascinating experiment in North Carolina that started in 1992, where they actually found that the that the returns were bigger than the investment itself. So basic income literally paid for itself. It was literally free money. Um, so again, uh, in that sense, I, mo I think it moves beyond traditional left and, and right wing politics, mm -hmm. um, because if you don't have a, have a heart, at least you have a wallet, right? And uh, and uh, investing it in each other, I think, is a very smart and wise decision, also from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. But in in the book, uh, Rutger, as well, you mention another important objection which you didn't mention there. Mm -hmm. and I think this is maybe the one that you know kind of some, someone sympathetic and to your arguments in the book and then having now read it etc is that which seems like quite a cruel objection in a way it's that people say well look universal basic income is going to um, be corrosive to moral character we shouldn't give poor people money because poor people will waste that money mm -hmm. on these bad things that poor people do or something like this yeah and this part of the book I talk about some fascinating new evidence from behavioral economics uh, which is really about what happens to you and what happens to your brain if you are poor um, a lot of people think that you know poor people make poor decisions because they are well to put it bluntly because they're dumb right <laughs> uh, what people on the the right say is oh they they've got no responsibility and we need to teach them or whatever and people on the left say oh we need to help them right we need to have another government program we need to have more bureaucrats or whatever teaching them of course how to set up their linkedin profile or how to handle their money blah 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 and then we have this whole industry of bureaucrats trying to help the poor what i argue in the book is that actually uh what the science tells us is that everyone would make poor decisions in the context of poverty. And there's there have been some really interesting experiments to, to show this. So the most famous one happened in India. It was with sugarcane cane farmers. And these farmers collect about 60% of their income, income all at once, uh, right after the harvest. And what they did is um, the farmers had to do an IQ test just before and after the harvest. Very simple experiment, but the difference in, in IQ was 14 points. Um, and that that is huge. Fourteen points is you know similar to to being a bit tipsy or having missed a night's sleep. Oh, wow. So that's what it's like to be poor. Uh, you could you could compare it to being really really busy and stressed out. You start focusing on the short term, and you're really good at handling things in the short term. But you start making so many unwise decisions uh, for the long term, right? You start eating less healthily, raise your kids less, less well, get out loans that you can't repay. So many of those things. Um, but the the takeaway is that we would all do the, do that if we would live in a context of poverty. So what do you do? Well, you get people out of poverty first. Mm -hmm. All the rest comes later. Um, there's one researcher, Elder Shafir. Who who's like the ex expert on the on the cognitive dimension of poverty, and he told me that if you do if you do anything else, let's say you focus on education first, hmm. it's it's similar to teaching someone how to sli swim and then throwing him in, into the ocean. Yeah. Right. So I mean, someone has learned something. You can swim, but who who cares if you can swim if you're in the in the ocean? Right. You'll yeah. still drown. Doesn't matter. 
Um, so get people out of the ocean first, mm -hmm. and then all, then all the rest. I love this example you use in the book of kind of like the situation of someone in poverty, like a computer. We both can have the same hardware, but when they're trying to run loads of different tasks, trying to get to the end of the week, whereas people out of poverty can think long term, you can see why they end up in, in these messes and making poor decisions. I guess the biggest thing which I've seen from influential thinkers speaking crudely on the right mm -hmm. is that the question is, where's this money going to come from but mm -hmm. your your point is that it's already there it just needs reshuffling so how do we reshuffle this money that's there and make sure that there is this dividends there because um, mm -hmm. there's a special place in hell for us if we don't have a plan mm. well um don't get me wrong i am really in favor of higher taxation i want higher wealth mm. taxes i want higher inheritance taxes i'm in favor of higher top marginal tax rates for the very mm -hmm. rich i mean inequality has been spiraling out of control in the UK and especially in the US, and um, you, we, I'm very happy that people are finally talking about taxation again. At, at the beginning of the of the of our conversation, I I mentioned that we used to have much higher taxes in the 50s and the 60s, which historians call the golden age of capitalism. Uh, we had the highest growth rates, extraordinary levels of innovation. We put a man on the moon, all those crazy things, and at the same time, we had very high taxes. Um, so capitalism needs taxation um, in order to, to work. We need to tame the beast. Now, it is also true at the same time that the welfare state that we have now, although it is an achievement of historic proportions, don't get me wrong, again, I mean, it's it's amazing, especially the, what we build in Europe, universal healthcare, public education. Mm -hmm. um, we should be immensely proud of that. But then the cash, the, 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 the welfare schemes that we have are often very, very bureaucratic and also very paternalistic. Um, so there are examples in, in the UK, in the US, in Holland, where I'm from, uh, of families who are really poor. And there's a, there's a circle of sometimes 10, sometimes 15, sometimes more than 20 care workers around them who are all trying to, to, to solve symptoms, but not going to the root of the problem, right. which is the poverty itself. Um, so in, in my book, I give a very simple example of men living on, on the streets, you know, the homeless. So often we're, we're spending 50,000, 100,000 or sometimes even more dollars, pounds, euros on people who are chronically homeless. You know, think about the, the police costs, the judicial costs, the, the, the hospitals, the care workers, etc., etc. Homelessness is really, really expensive. Um, what would happen if we would just give, like, say, 10% of all that money, just give it to the homeless? Well, they did one experiment in London, a very small but fascinating experiment, where they just gave £3,000 to, to, to the homeless. And a year later, 7 out of 13 had a roof above their head. Two more had applied for housing. And uh, it was even The Economist, you know, the, 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 the sort of the free market uh, magazine, who uh, who later wrote that the, the most efficient way to spend money on the homeless might be just to give it to them. So yeah, I do believe that there's a lot of improvement, uh, a lot of room for improvement, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, even though I also believe that we need a bigger public sector, higher taxation, just as we had in the past. So and one of the other things you mentioned in the book, Rutger, aside from universal basic income, is... Um, in chapter nine, really, and it's the beyond the gates of the lands of plenty. Mm -hmm. So it's all well and good that here we are set up to the best of our ability uh, and try and install some utopia. Mm -hmm. But the thing, what what happens is, okay, we st install a utopia, and here's a line in the sand. Dare you cross it, and you're in trouble. So in this chapter, you tell us quite a few things how national borders are, to paraphrase, the most discriminatory invention ever concocted in the history of the world. You tell us that the random Easters and their evidence, evidence, evidence-based approach to economics and aid. You tell us about that. And that foreign aid development funds are, basically, their good intentions aside, a pale shade of simply eradicating tax havens. The solution, you tell us, is open borders. Could you tell us a little more about, for instance, why you think national borders are one of the most discriminatory inventions concocted in the history of the world? Mm -hmm. Well, first off, I should admit that 
this is the most radical idea in my book. Maybe mm. this is the only truly utopian idea in my book. <laughs> I mean, basic income, we we almost had that, actually. If you go back to the 70s, it was, it was actually Richard Nixon, of all mm. people, the Republican president, who almost implemented a small basic income. He got it through the House of Representatives twice, and then it was killed in the Senate because... Well, the Democrats love the idea of a basic income, but they wanted a higher one. So they voted against this proposal because they thought, you know, there will be another one in the future. Uh, that turned out differently. Uh, but then again, I mean, um, we can easily afford it. We can do it right now. The The mov movement is growing. Um, basic income is by far the most realistic idea in my book. Open borders is different. I mean, I realize that the political zeitgeist is not very favor favorable mm. uh, these days to the idea of just getting rid of borders. Mm. Um, it's moving in the opposite direction. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But here again, history history is very helpful. So if you look at borders, the first thing you'll find out is that actually borders are a very, very recent invention. It goes back to the late 19th century. If you read like Jules Verne, for example, uh, travel around the globe in what is it, 40 days? 80. Uh, 80 days? Anyway, travel around the globe. Um, actually, in that in that book, there are hardly any 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 borders, and uh, there's a, there is even p people some people making remarks about passports and how useless they are, hmm. and that only backward countries like Russia and the Ottoman <laughs> Empire have them, right? So the idea was that all borders would disappear in the future, yeah. and then that was the, what what the future was going to look like. It's only after the, the, the First War, World War, or during the First World War, I should say, that this started to change. Um, and nowadays, we live in this world where, where it's harder and harder to cross, to cross borders and where indeed 60% mm -hmm. of your income is dependent on the simple fact uh, that you were born in this or that country. People think that we have higher immigration than ever. Well, no, not really. It's just two to three percent of the world population lives in a different country than in the country in which they were born. Mm -hmm. So we have very, very little immigration. Uh, if you if you watch if follow the news again, you'll think that Europe, for example, was flooded by immigrants. If you look at the actual statistics, uh, it's it's you know relative to the Euro European population of 500 million. We're talking about relatively small numbers, and indeed, since 2015, it's it has been reduced to almost nothing. Again, this is not inevitable, and that is this is not um, standard throughout history. The other thing that I try to point out is that actually immigration can be, it's not necessarily, but can be a great force for good. Uh, mm. It is by far the most powerful tool we have, for example, in the fight against global poverty. So if someone emigrates from, say, sub-Saharan Africa to Europe or the US or whatever, his or her income goes up like tenfold. It's mm. huge. You know, there's nothing, there's no kind of development aid, there's no charity that can achieve anything similar. Mm -hmm. um, and then you you maybe worry that, oh, but they come here and they, they take away our goods and services, right? Well, no, actually, most economists agree that whether we're talking about high-skilled or low-skilled immigration, um, they bring more jobs. Uh, then they uh, then they take away they they bring more wealth than they take away. Uh, again, I know that this is not very popular these days, uh, but if you're being re realistic and not your let yourself be swept away by all the rhetoric the mm. uh, rhetoric that's going around these days, um, I think you'll have to acknowledge um, that borders are one of the you know the biggest sources of injustice these days, and um, we might look back on them. Uh, say a hundred or two hundred years from now, as as one of the biggest crimes uh, that we're committing right now. Another one of the interesting things. Uh, so you kind of go through that. Here are all these, you know, classics, seven or so arguments of what people say to mm -hmm. anti um, open borders and to kind of anti immigration. And like you mentioned a few of them there. And one of them is, you know, if we have open borders, when these immigrants get here, they'll never leave. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, that's just not true. It's a well-known, what do you call it? Is, is it called the paradox of um, open borders or something like this? Yeah. Well, you actually make things worse if you start building higher walls. Mm. So this is the big irony of Donald Trump's wall. Yeah, this is why it's poignant, right? Yeah. Moment. If he manages to get it built, then actually the U.S. will have more illegal immigrants. And the reason is very simple. 
what happens is that immigrants still come, but the journey becomes more difficult. So you don't want to go back anymore. Right. Right. And uh, if you would have more like a breathing border, as the U.S. had in the 70s, what happens is that you have these illegal immigrants, but they go back after a while. Mm-hmm. So in the 60s and the 70s, about 85 percent of all Mexicans who went to the U.S. to work for a while, they all went back. 85 percent. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, that's less than what is it? 15 percent or something like that. Look it up in my book. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that is an astonishing decline. Mm-hmm. Um, if the U.S. wouldn't have militarized the border, if it wouldn't have made it much more difficult to to get into the U.S., then it would have had millions and millions fewer illegal immigrants today. Hmm. It's it's really bizarre. So um, yeah, people, you only make things worse if you start building higher walls. And if you want fewer illegal immigrants, you start you should demolish the walls basically. Uh, that's what the science tells us here. Yeah, good. Uh, just a final question on this one because I think, uh, as you've said, this is kind of flowing against the zeitgeist of the time. And I was shocked to read in the book that since the year two thousand, over three quarters of the border walls in in the world have been erected. Mm-hmm. Um, now you cite a couple of things in against the idea that immigrants are responsible for crime and so on. So you say, Mm -hmm. uh, page uh, 222, the annual odds of being killed in the US in an attack by foreigners or immigrants was just one in 3,609,709. And you go on to say that uh, research at the University of Warwick has found that um, a decline in terrorist attacks is associated with higher immigration. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's the locals, the indigenous people of a country who end up in um, causing more social problems, end up in having more prison sentences. But isn't the response from um, this person who's uh, epitomizing the zeitgeist that here's perfect evidence in favor of the idea that walls work, that when we control immigration, that we can choose the people with the right backgrounds and therefore crimes not increase. If we open up the borders big time, are we not going to have all these uh, these ISIS fighters and so on in, mm-hmm. in, in the West? I think the idea here is that the vast majority of the immigrants is actually relatively more entrepreneurial and you know wants to work harder than the native population and you especially see this in the US is less likely to end up in prison or to commit a crime so you would actually make america safer if you would you know relatively speaking if you would let in more immigrants mm-hmm. now the whole issue with terrorism is obviously is that it's going to be very hard to to keep them out anyway so what I've always been in favor of is something what what uh, the researchers here call the Dutch approach. Right. So if you again go back in history and look at what happened in the 70s, you had you know you had a lot of ter- terrorism in Europe, and back then it didn't come from Islamists, but it came from left wing radicals, right? So you had the the Brigata Rossa in uh, in Italy, you had the uh, Rote Armee Fraktion. In, uh, in Germany and and then there was one country where there also were radicals and terrorists but where there almost no one died and this was Holland uh, so what what did, did they do uh, two things in public they said almost nothing about terrorism so they called them criminals um, they didn't give them a stage they asked the media to you know to not really report on them to not say anything about you know their their, their you know plans for an, more atrocities or whatever um, and then at the same time, we had a very strong secret surface that was in, infiltrating these terrorist cells all the time. So at some point in some terrorist cells, you know, you had a terrorist cell of four people and three of them would be working for the secret service. So then it becomes very hard to, you know, to, um, to do anything because there's always someone who messes something up, right? Um, this is what they call the Dutch approach, and it worked really well. Even in, in Italy and in Germany, the, there were a lot of horrible things happen, happening, but then in Holland, not much. There was one there was one period where <laughs> a couple of Dutch terrorists went to Yemen for a terrorist training camp, and these Dutch terrorists were really shocked when they saw the German and the Italian and the Palestinian terrorists who were so much, you know, so much more violent than they were. Uh, so they came back and said, you know, it's uh, this is not this is not okay anymore. They're way too <laughs> t- way too violent. Um, I think uh, I think that the, these are the, the much more effective mm. methods to look at, uh, and it doesn't have much to do with you know your specific immigration policy.
Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, that was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>